While Sean Boswell may not have left an enormous stamp on the Fast and Furious franchise, his own story in the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift is actually pretty packed. From juvenile delinquency to being crowned Tokyo's newest Drift King, here's Sean's Fast and Furious backstory explained. Growing up, Sean Boswell never stayed in one place for very long. His parents divorced when he was three years old, and his father, a U.S. Navy officer, eventually left the country for a position in Tokyo, Japan. Back in the States, Sean and his mother moved frequently, often due to young Sean's reckless or criminal behavior. Their roots are in Alabama, but by the time the audience first meets Sean at the start of Tokyo Drift, he's attending a high school in Arizona, his third town in only two years. At 17, Sean is a loner, interested in only one thing, driving. We don't know where this love affair with cars begins, but we do know that he takes to driving and street racing pretty quickly. Sean gets a speeding ticket on his first day as a licensed driver and handedly wins his first race the day after that. Sean finds a sense of calm and control in the act of driving, but it only makes his life more chaotic. He gets two arrests on his record before Tokyo Drift even starts. However, since he and his mother leave town every time he screws up, Sean is used to escaping long-term consequences for his actions. As a result, he doesn't seem to care much about the destruction he causes. One afternoon after school, Sean finds himself chatting with his classmate, Cindy, much to the irritation of Cindy's football star boyfriend, Clay. After some teasing from Sean, Clay throws a baseball through the window of Sean's prized 1971 Chevy Monte Carlo. Cindy, who clearly gets a kick out of playing with her boyfriend's insecurities, suggests that Clay and Sean settle their dispute in a street race, putting herself up as the prize. The two drivers race through a construction site for an upscale suburban housing development. Falling behind in the race, Sean attempts to take a shortcut through one of the half-built houses. This puts him neck and neck with Clay and Cindy and helps him get to the finish line first. But Clay's aggressive driving ends up sending both cars out of control, and all three participants are injured. After the construction site debacle, the police threaten Sean with some serious charges that could finally stick. However, Sean's mother manages to arrange one last reprieve by sending him off to Tokyo to live with his father. Major Boswell sets a few strict but simple rules for Sean to live by. Go to school, come right home, and no driving. But since Sean has never been inclined to follow rules, he gets involved in the Tokyo street racing scene right away. When Major Boswell learns that Sean has disobeyed him, he initially threatens to have him sent back to the U.S. But then the Major decides to give Sean one last chance, and the subject of Sean breaking their arrangement is never brought up again. Sean doesn't have to work very hard to find his crowd in Tokyo. The first person to befriend him at school is Twinkie, an American Army brat who knows about a race happening that very night. Twinkie takes Sean to a multi-level parking structure where young drivers race to the top, executing precise drifts to turn tight corners. There, he encounters another of his classmates, Neela, and doesn't waste any time in beginning to flirt. But once again, he butts heads with a jealous boyfriend. Neela is involved with Takashi, who earned his nickname DK, short for Drift King, for being the best racer on the circuit. Having learned nothing from his last disastrous race in Arizona, the foolish and headstrong Sean challenges Takashi to a race. Eager for the chance to embarrass the American teen, Takashi accepts. But there are two problems. Sean has neither a car to race with, nor the first idea of how drifting works. Takashi's friend, the enigmatic Han, solves the first problem, offering up his own highly modified Nissan Silvia S15 on a lark. The second, however, proves insurmountable. Twinkie tries to quickly explain drifting to Sean, but to no avail. Sean winds up humiliating himself and doing thousands of dollars worth of damage to Han's Nissan. Han, upon seeing how thoroughly Sean has trashed his car, has just three parting words for Sean. Don't leave town. Sean is now heavily indebted to Han, who we get to know much better in future Fast and Furious films. In order to work off his debt, Sean begins working for Han, doing whatever the more established racer asks. Han runs a garage and has vaguely defined connections to organized crime. Though Sean is insulated from the details of his business, Sean only needs to concern himself with pickups and deliveries and answering the phone whenever Han calls. These are rules Sean has no trouble following. He begins spending more and more of his time with Han, going so far as to move out of his father's apartment and into a bunk at Han's garage. Han is genuinely fond of Sean and has no hard feelings over the wrecked Nissan. In fact, Han sees the loss of one car as a bargain in exchange for getting to know someone's character. The two develop a close relationship as Han teaches Sean that there's more to life than just racing. But of course, this being a Fast and the Furious movie, racing is still important. While American street racing came very naturally to Sean, he doesn't hold a candle to the skilled Tokyo drifters. Han agrees to teach Sean how to drift so that he can have a chance at a rematch against Takashi. Having to essentially start from scratch and really work at something seems to teach Sean some much-needed discipline, and the training pays off as Sean wins his return race against Takashi's lieutenant, Morimoto. It's easy to get the impression that it's been years since Sean was in any one place long enough to make friends. 
It seems as though he's long since given up on the idea of getting attached to people. Upon arriving in Tokyo, Sean is disinterested in talking to anyone since he assumes that he'll be sent back to the US soon. But as his stay in Tokyo lasts longer than he imagined, Sean begins to make real connections to some of his peers, especially Twinkie. Back in Arizona, Sean once turned a blind eye to another kid being bullied, and he makes a point of standing up for Twinkie when he's attacked at school. While Twinkie berates Sean for his interference, it still shows significant growth from where he was prior to coming to Tokyo. Sean also spends time sharing in Twinkie's interests, accompanying him on one of his sales excursions on the streets of Tokyo. Later, when Sean's feud with Takashi becomes a life-and-death struggle, Twinkie gives Sean all of his savings to help Sean resolve things peacefully. If not for this act of friendship, it's unlikely that Sean would have survived to the end of Tokyo Drift. Sean also steadily matures in his interactions with Neela. His early flirtations are swiftly rebuffed, but soon he begins to make the effort to actually get to know her on her own terms. Gradually, the two become real friends. Sean and Neela bond over their shared love of cars and drift racing, but also their mutual status as outsiders in Japanese society. Despite being born in Japan, Neela carries the stigma of being the child of an Australian immigrant, who Takashi implies was a sex worker. After her mother's death, Neela was taken in by the Yakuza-affiliated Kamada family. But despite being raised alongside Takashi, she's never treated as if she truly belongs. Even Takashi treats Neela more like a possession than a person. Sean and Neela's relationship doesn't go unnoticed by Takashi, who beats up Sean as a warning to stay away from his girlfriend. This is the last straw for Neela, who finds the courage to leave Takashi and take shelter at Han's garage. By his own admission, one of the reasons Han likes keeping Sean around is to annoy his business partner Takashi. While Takashi is the better connected of the two, Han is older and more shrewd. As it turns out, Han may also be using Sean to divert Takashi's attention from a far more serious betrayal. Han has been stealing from the commission owed to Kamada, humiliating Takashi in the eyes of his uncle. Takashi comes to Han's garage seeking revenge and is further enraged to see that Neela and Sean are both living there. The three of them flee the scene, Han in one car, Sean and Neela in another. They're pursued individually by Takashi and his friend Morimoto in a high-speed city chase. When Takashi is neck and neck with Sean and Neela and attempts to nudge them off the road, Han drops back and puts his own car between them. This helps get Sean and Neela out of danger, but it puts Han in the path of oncoming traffic. Out of nowhere, he is T-boned by another uninvolved vehicle and is apparently killed in the ensuing explosion. Later, in Fast and Furious 6, we learn that the accident was really attempted murder by Deckard Shaw, and in F9, we see that Han actually survived, somehow. After Han's supposed death, Sean no longer has any protection from Takashi, who still wants him dead. Sean's father offers to send him back to the United States to escape Takashi's vengeance, but Sean refuses. He feels responsible for the mess he's in, and his days of running away from his problems are over. Instead, he throws himself at the mercy of Takashi's uncle, Kamada, apologizing in person for Han's deception and offering a non-violent resolution to his conflict with Takashi. We race and the loser leaves town for good. The absurd suggestion seems to amuse Kamada, and the challenge is accepted. With his own car damaged in the chase and the rest of Han's car seized by the police, Sean once again finds himself without a ride for his race against the Drift King. All that's left in Han's garage is the wreck of the Nissan that Sean used in his ill-fated drift racing debut. Sean, Twinkie, and the rest of Han's pit crew join forces to combine the high-performance parts from Han's Nissan with the chassis of a vintage Mustang belonging to Sean's dad creating a new ride that's both American and Japanese. Following a high-speed race down a precarious winding mountainside road, Sean crosses the finish line first, winning his and Neela's freedom and the title of Drift King. At the end of the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, Sean is paid a visit by main franchise protagonist Dominic Toretto, who challenges him to a race in honor of their mutual friend Han. Later, Furious 7 explains that this encounter wasn't simply the result of a friendly visit. Rather, Dom traveled to Tokyo while on the trail of Han's killer, Deckard Shaw. The events of Furious 7 brought Toretto's team into the retcon timeline that saw Tokyo Drift occurring after the events of Fast and Furious 6. The guys in Japan weren't heard from again until F9 found them on another continent altogether. By then, Sean and his buddies Twinkie and Earl have moved to Germany, where they now build specialty cars for the government. Toretto's team is doing their own secret government work these days, usually for a character named Mr. Nobody, the leader of a very hush-hush covert ops organization. Dom's latest mission has to do with stopping Cypher from overtaking the world with a universal hacking device called Project Ares, and Dom sends Tej and Roman to recruit the German outpost to their cause. There is, of course, no mention of the romance Sean had back in Tokyo Drift, but there have legitimately been a couple years between then and now, even on this convoluted timeline, so a breakup is reasonable. Plus, it's safe to assume that if he moved full-time to Germany, he wasn't still with Neela. 
Watching Sean's crew at work is kind of like asking the question, what if Jackass existed in the Cars universe? When Roman and Tej arrive in Germany, Sean, Twinkie, and Earl are strapping high-powered rocket engines to the roofs of Pontiac Fieros, sporty two-seaters built between 1984 and 1988 that look like matchbox cars. The purpose of this firecracker experiment is apparently to race jet planes. The guys are generally thrilled if their sacrificial Fiero neither blows up nor melts at the end, so that says all there is to say about how successful they are. Still, Roman and Tej are there specifically for some wheels at Dom's request, and they intend to procure some. For reasons too convoluted to list, Tej and Roman must get into close physical contact with an orbiting satellite in order for Ramsey to prevent the Universal Hacking Program Project Ares from taking over the world once uploaded. Luckily, they just so happen to know a few guys working with rockets. Soon, Sean and Earl are piloting a giant plane into the stratosphere with a rocket-powered Pontiac Fiero strapped on top where it will then have to make contact with a satellite 50 miles above the Earth's surface while in that perpetual freefall known as orbit. Sure, Earl's still running launch simulations on his iPad, but they're at least mostly certain that the DIY astronauts will be safe. Soon, the Fiero has broken through the atmosphere, with Tej and Roman along for the ride. Now that Tej's math and science has brought them this far, Roman's in charge. Numbers is what you do, right? Driving is what I do. After all is said and done, Dom throws a family cookout back at his place in Los Angeles, and now the family includes Earl, Twinkie, and Sean. Family has always been a theme for the franchise and a driving force for Dom in particular. The men and women of the crew are his brethren, so it's fitting that when Han comes around the corner and sees Sean grabbing beers with the rest of the Tokyo gang, the two embrace like long-lost brothers. Han introduces the guys to Elle, who has been his ward since her parents were killed, and Sean hugs her too. Everyone mingles about, and the camera jumps from group to group to check in on how everyone is doing. And that's pretty much it for Sean Boswell thus far. 